I'm grateful for the things that you have done and yes I'm grateful for the victory we won I could go on and on and on about Anxiety, loneliness. the Bible says, keep thy heart in all the diligence, for at the issues of life,
my life, God, all I can say is I'm grateful. Oh, gratefulness.
Take your seat. Hallelujah. Glory, we give you glory today. I bless God, I bless God, I bless God for those that have come before me to set the atmosphere for the beautiful display within the skit and the play that began and opened up today. What a mighty God we serve, an accurate description of what it means to be desperate, desperate desperate to be delivered, to be healed, and to be set free. God bless you. God bless you, woman of God. God bless you to the pastor of this house, Pastor Derek Miller, First Lady Miller, Valerie Miller. These are my family, y'all. This is friends. This is family to me. Amen. And I bless God even for the invitation. I bless God even for the invitation. I smiled and paused because y'all heard Lady Valerie say, she has extended the invitation for this conference a multitude, we'll just say many times, over the years. And, uh, amen, how many ever, how many knows what it feels like to run from something and that you don't really feel totally ready to do a thing? Somebody's clapping, she understands, I got a few applause. Everybody else is bold and y'all just walk in it and that's good. That's good, God bless you for your boldness and your obedience, that's a blessing. Amen. But sometimes when you're called to do a thing or asked to do a thing, it doesn't feel comfortable and it does not feel easy. But how many know when we give God our yes, he told me, give me your yes and I'll do the rest. Yeah. And so when I gave God my yes, instead of responding to Lady Valerie, I was silent. And I thought, if I don't say nothing, she's just going to let it slide and she'll find somebody else. No, 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 no. I got a response with a flyer with my picture on it. I said, my God, okay, I already knew that I couldn't say no because sometimes you get to the point where you, you know if you don't do the will of God, you've, gotten, you've been chastened enough and you've been reprimanded enough by the Holy Spirit that you know you better not say no to some things. And so I didn't say no. I was just like, I'm going to be silent, you know. And the silence, she heard the yes. And I bless God, amen, for the invitation that was extended because there is a need. There was a need in the house, and there was a need for this time that, as the topic says, with the Renew Conference, the unclocked heart. And so I stand before you today by the grace of God. I thank God for, um, as it is mentioned, for pastor and overseer, um, sister, for Lady Annis Yakey, and um, also to Elder Yakey, 
Amen. Of Jesus House of Prayer Temple um, in route now. Hopefully they'll be able to arrive. My father, Bishop Robert A. Hornberger and Sister Hornberger, I bless God for them as well. I bless God that in the process of 13 years now, um, I was able to inherit a spiritual mother of the gospel through marrying my spouse, none other than Elder Frederick Thomas Yankee Sr., amen, and uh, by the grace of God in our union, um, we were able to, some people didn't realize this, well, I didn't realize it, how challenging it will be to marry somebody that's already in ministry and you come from ministry, but God blessed the thing and did the work that only he could do through us. And so I thank God for my extended, my spiritual family now that both of our parents are in the gospel and we have the now obligation to walk in. That's a weight to walk in what God has called us to be in ministry and not just standing up on a podium because I'll tell y'all the truth, this is not my comfort zone, not speaking in this capacity. I sing all day long because that's what I love to do. But uh, when God does a thing, he does it well. And so I have a word to share with you tonight just wanted to get those um, acknowledgments out of the way and just do things in decency and order, but I have come with anticipation for what God has for us tonight. I have come with anticipation of a great work that God is going to do in the lives of the women that are sitting in these seats and those who will fill them tomorrow. I am giving God praise in advance right now for doing a great work that only he can do. I am praising God for fulfilling his promises unto us. So I ask that you turn with me in the Bible and the word of God to our theme scripture that's found in Proverbs chapter four and verse 23. Proverbs chapter four and verse 23 reads, if you would stand, please, and read this with me. We're going to simply just read that first theme scripture, and then I have one accompanying scripture that we'll read along with it as we move forward and dive into what God wants to speak to us tonight. Proverbs chapter 4, 23, would you respond by amen if you haven't? Amen. amen. Let's read together. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Amen. Our supporting scripture tonight is going to be found in Psalms 51. And we're going to read verses 10 through 13. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 51. Would you respond with amen if you have it? Amen. And we're going to read, uh, I said 10 through 13. Let's read those three scriptures, or four together. Amen. Verse 10, created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the heeding of his holy word. Can we say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We bless God today, for he is faithful to do just what he said he would do. And I ask that you join with me just for a few minutes. I won't be before you long. I'm not long-winded, and my, my children, if they were here, would tell you that it's true, because they say, Daddy says that he's not long-winded, but then he gets up and talks for a long time. I, I try to be consistent and hold true to what I say, but I ultimately want God to have his way. Heart failure. Heart failure occurs when the heart is unable to pump blood around the body properly because it has become too weak or stiff. If you have recently been diagnosed with heart failure, this is from the American Heart Association, it says your treatment plan will depend on the stage at which your heart failure has been determined. According to the American Heart Association, there are four stages of heart failure. 
symbolized by A, B, C, and D. Stages that are more severe and less severe according to the spectrum of diagnosis. Here are a few more statistics for you, statistics for you in regards to heart disease and heart failure. It says one person dies every 36 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. About 659,000 plus people in the United States die from heart disease each year. That's one in every four deaths. It says despite the increasing awareness over the past decade, about half, that's about 56% of women, recognize that heart disease is their number one killer. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, killing a multitude, this says in 2017, 299,000, or about one in every female deaths. Heart disease, I'm looking around the room, is the leading cause of death for African American and white women in the United States. About one in 16 women ages 20 and older have coronary heart disease the most common type of heart disease that there is. Follow with me. What are some of the natural symptoms of heart disease? This may be familiar to some of you and to some others it may be foreign. It says, although some women have no symptoms, others may have them. Some symptoms include dull and heavy sharp chest pains or discomfort. Pain in the neck, the jaw, or the throat. Pain in the upper abdomen, or sometimes pain in the back. These symptoms may happen when you are resting. These symptoms may also happen when you're doing regular daily activities. Women also may have other symptoms that include things such as this, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. If I were to have a sign up, I would put fatigue in bold. Sometimes heart disease may be silent and not diagnosed until you have other symptoms or emergencies. And those emergencies include and that are listed most frequently, heart attack, heart failure, and arrhythmia. This is the fluttering of the chest or the heart. Several statistics there for you to think about. This is for the natural heart our physical heart, the heart that God placed in our physical bodies, amen? You might sit there and think, why is she rambling off statistics about heart failure? What does that have to do with me? Why are these relevant? The reality is our natural habits and our natural bodies are often a mirror and a reflection of our spiritual state. That's the truth and that's the reality of the matter. Y'all know it's true because a lot of times our poor spiritual habits are a reflection of our natural habits. How many times have you started a healthy diet and said that I'm going to make sure that I focus on eating these certain types of foods and I'm gonna make a sacrifice and make sure that I exercise or I'm active and I operate and do the things that I need to do, stay busy and active versus being lazy and sitting around and eating all the stuff that tastes good and feel good to my body. We do it, we do it subconsciously, we do it repeatedly, we do it re religiously without hesitation sometimes, without thinking about it. And the same thing happens in our spiritual, in our spiritual bodies. How many times do we fail to acknowledge and to take the time and to sacrifice and to feed our spiritual man? To fast and to pray and to seek the face of God for the guidance and the direction that we stand in need of. No, instead, we walk around like we got it all figured out. More often than not, more frequently than not, we try to carry the weight on our own. We try to do it all ourselves. And often we end up broken. We end up empty. We end up weak. 
frustrated, angry even, because things are not going the way that we anticipated. Broken hearted, yes. Feeling like there's no way out. This happens to us both spiritually and physically. And so I had to take a moment just to dig a little bit, to find out a little bit about this physical heart. Because as I said, it's a reflection. A lot of times our activity that we do in our flesh is a reflection of what we do spiritually on a daily basis. Frequently we're, get, we're quick to give advice to others. We can tell somebody real, real, real easily for the most part what it's gonna take for them to be healthy. If you're a parent in here, you can give it, anybody, any parents in here, any mothers in here, we can tell our children what they need to do. I'm guilty of it. I will tell my child what they need to eat. Eat your green vegetables and eat you know, your fruits. After they finish eating and go to bed, I make my DoorDash order. <laughs> or I might already have it hidden in the car because I want to have some alone time when I take my pleasure in what I'm going to take and eat. Somebody understands, y'all don't sit in the garage before because you don't want to share with your children once you get in the house. I've been there, I do that. Amen, you want some peace? I'd be like, Lord, this is self-care. I need this moment. I need this time. But in that moment, in that time, all the healthy tips that I've given them and told them they needed to follow, look, I'm gonna pig out because I deserve it. You know what I mean? And so we do that. We can give tips and we can give suggestions and even advice to so many others, but how frequently do we take that advice to heart for ourselves? What standard are we hurting ourselves for? Holding yourself to. And then we put it in the spiritual sense. What, what has God told us to do? We know to fast and to pray. We know to read our Bibles every day. We know the discipline that it takes to wake up in the morning, first thing or last thing before we lay down at night, to seek the face of God and say, God, I cast all my cares upon you, for I know that you care for me. But all too frequently, we walk around and we carry that weight and we do it all ourselves because we're superwoman. I can handle it. I can do it. I got it all figured out. But on the inside, we're fatigued, we're weak. Some of the spiritual symptoms of heart failure, they're listed right there before the passage that I read here in, in Proverbs. Before we even got started I, started, I read some of those spiritual symptoms. And I heard it in prayer. One of those that's listed right before our verse, that our, our theme verse was listed was wickedness. Wickedness. You heard the scripture that talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. Wickedness is one of the spiritual symptoms of heart failure, that spiritual heart failure. Think about some other things, and I'm just gonna list a few because I know we have a whole conference, so I'm gonna not hit them all, but I wanted just, to, just for you to take a moment to think about what could be clogging up my spiritual heart. What could be creating that barrier that's resulting in the symptoms that we're experiencing right now. Unforgiveness, that's deep. We can spend all night right there. Unforgiveness, y'all, it's easy to say with our lips, and sometimes not so easy, but we can say with our lips and more challenging to truly forgive within our heart. The forgiveness that says, you know what, I, that doesn't even affect me anymore. I can speak to you and keep going. My heart is not pierced anymore. I've let God mend me. I've let God make me whole. Unforgiveness, insecurities. Oh, this is a big one for the ladies in the house. How many times have we doubted our capacity and, and judged ourselves and compared ourselves to somebody else that ain't even looking in your direction? Sis, you look good. Tell yourself you look good when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror. You don't have to look like nobody else, small, Big, tall, short, whatever shape, whatever size. I tell the women, any woman that I encounter, rock what you got and make it look good because you can look good no matter who you are. You hear me? Insecurities will eat at your heart, eat at your relationships. Why? Because that comparison is there. And you're feeling like, I'm not good enough. 
I'm not good enough. Insecurity can lead to depression. Insecurity to, can, will lead to all the doubt and fear and anxiety. All these things, these things, these symptoms. Insecurity can be the root of those things. And that's not of God. I remember a time that I struggled with depression and God told me, he said, the moment you say that you're not good enough, you're saying that I didn't do my job. That's a smack in my face. That's saying that I am not adequate enough to do the work of perfecting you. Just like my word says, you don't call me a liar? Is that what you're gonna do? Because every time you doubt who you are in me, that's what you're doing. That's what you're saying to the God of all God and the kings of all kings. He didn't create us for that. So some of the spiritual symptoms, again, of that heart disease or that heart failure, we said unforgiveness, insecurity. Somebody said, insecurity be gone. Insecurity be gone. You can't live here. You can't let live here. The next one is fear. Fear that comes to pierce and to paralyze. Sometimes we are operating in fear and don't even realize it. Ask me how I know. I've been there. I've been in the position before where I was asked to do a thing or, or even challenged to do a thing and I, I had such strong insecurity that I said, I can't do it and I'm not going to do it. And what happened then? I cut myself off from the blessings of God because God wanted to use me and God wants to use you. But as long as you allow the enemy to wrestle with you and to feed you lies of what you can't be and what you're not supposed to do and where you're not gonna go because you're looking back at what you've done in your past and comparing yourself to Susie, Sarah, Martha, Beyonce, whoever it is, Instead of saying, I got this. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What am I doing standing up thinking and saying to myself that I'm crazy? He's a mind regulator, a sound mind. He's come to give you peace that passes all understanding. That means it's beyond our comprehension. Any other spirit that's doing speaking, any other thing to you, is not of God. You gotta tell yourself, oh, that ain't it. God didn't give me that. God did not give me the spirit of fear. God did not give you the spirit of fear. But number one, he said power. That means you can rebuke the enemy. Rebuke yourself even sometimes. Ladies, we gotta talk to ourselves sometimes. Encourage yourself sometimes. Stop fishing for the compliments. You gotta look in the mirror and say, I look good. Even if don't nobody tell me today, I look good and I feel good and I'm covered by the blood of the lamb. And he's given me the strength that I stand in need of to move forward and to carry out and to do his will. Hopelessness, doubt, iniquities, hidden sins, all spiritual symptoms and signs that could lead to heart failure, spiritual heart failure. We talked about the physical symptoms and now we're talking about the spiritual. Why? Because you see what I'm talking about? They can parallel, they can mirror each other. When we're going through the tests and the trial, a lot of times we allow this fatigue to set in. And y'all, the strongest thing even now is this exhaustion that's been attached to and this fear and anxiety that has been attached through to this season that we've gone through with COVID, with this pandemic, this pandemic that's causing others to feel as though they can't move forward, stagnant. Fear has gripped the hearts of man. Questioning everything, God, what is going on? I listed on here as well grief. We've experienced so much loss in this past year and beyond. And grief can be so overwhelmingly paralyzing that you cannot operate or function. If you've ever experienced grief, real grief, it will captivate your heart and your mind and make you question, my God, why? 
Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody in here just trusts God through it all. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever questioned, God, why? How? What have I done to deserve this? How can I be here? And Lord, there's no way that I can go on. The question's so deep that sometimes you've asked yourself, God, are you real? Are you still there? Can you hear me? Can you feel me? These are the symptoms, y'all, the symptoms of spiritual heart failure. And you ask me how I know because I've been there. I know what it feels like. Last year, even this time, I felt that fatigue. I felt that weakness. I felt that overwhelming feeling of, God, what in the world is going on? I can't make it. Anybody ever felt like you wanted to give up? They say throw in the towel. Well, I felt like I trust you, God. I know that you're real, but I just can't, I just can't do it. And as soon as I can and I said that I couldn't do it and I, I couldn't go through, and I said, Lord, I can't take no more, I received a call around this time last year. And it was the I can't take no more. And what happened in the process of receiving this call, that whole month I had just been going through, I had been going through, and I had continued to go to work and do what I needed to do, take care of the children, you know, all my duties that I needed to do, but I was moving on autopilot. Anybody know what that feels like on autopilot? Yeah. Women of God, we do this very, very easily. You know what you're obligated to do. If you're a parent, there's no days off, so you gotta stay on and you moving, and I was on autopilot, and I was like, God, I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm so weak, I'm so fatigued, I'm doing it, but whew, I need help, I need strength. And then I received a call. I received a call that my sister was on her way to the hospital. She didn't give me the message, I believe my brother did at that night, and I began to pray within myself and cry, and I said, God, I just said I couldn't take no more, I can't take this. As I received that call, Lady Valerie had called me earlier that day. And I was so, so frantic that all I could do was call the last number that I received. And I don't even know what I intended to happen or who I intended to answer the phone. But when she answered, I said, I need you to pray. And I began to cry. I was getting my keys and I was getting ready to leave the house. And my husband was with the children. I was leaving and, and she began to pray. And I heard Pastor Derek in the background begin to pray and plead the blood of Jesus. And as they began to pray, God began to give me strength and he began to let me know that it's gonna be okay. I, don't, I didn't know how it was gonna work out, but he just began to let me know that he was gonna be okay. And at some point, I can't even remember the details, but I hung up the phone and I traveled to the hospital. That night we weren't able to go into the room because it was COVID and they didn't allow you to come in because of limited visitation and things of that nature. And so the next two days or so it passed and God allowed me to be in the hospital with my sister, but I began to pray. And Lady Valerie may not remember this, but she called and checked on me and she t sent text messages and asked how my sister was doing. And I just knew the saints, I could feel the prayers. Yet I'm gonna see, I could feel the prayers. And God began to talk to me. If you've ever been in a 911 situation where your heart is broken and you need God to do a thing that only he can do, and you're trusting God because your life is on the line as you're praying for somebody else. Because you're saying to yourself, there's no way that I can make it through. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I cannot phantom in my mind anything else, but you got to do this. Because I can't process the outcome of anything else. Long story short, God worked a miracle. God worked a miracle. He put the doctors at arm. It turned out, it came in and said one thing and they had all these ideas and diagnosis and things that they were saying, oh, she's gonna need to be in rehabilitation and her brain, you know, that we don't know, functions, things of that nature, all these things were said. And I sat in that hospital room and I said, whose report are you gonna believe? I'm gonna believe the report of the Lord in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So as I sat in that hospital room, I think it was the third day that she was in the hospital, I began to pray. The doctors came in and said so many things. Oh, we're gonna have to give her a tube because she's not eating. I, I ordered DoorDash in the name of Jesus. And I fed my sister in the name of Jesus. I said, you gotta eat in the name of Jesus. Force fed her. She didn't know what was happening. Up until that day, they hadn't even had her get up yet. She got up while I was there in the hospital. I was just saying in the name of Jesus, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. Do the work, Jesus, do the work. It was an emergency, yeah. and God met me there. I remember the night that I left that hospital, and I told the nurses, 
I warned them. I said, you let me know anything that happens tonight. The initial thing I tried to do was stay there and hide behind a curtain. They caught me because they told you you have a time limit that you can stay in the hospital. I was hiding behind a curtain. And I told my sister, if I stay here long enough, stiff enough, they'll do their rounds and I'll be able to stay the night. She said, okay. A little while later, the nurse came in and said, uh, ma'am, I'm behind the curtain. Yes, you're gonna have to leave. I got my things. And with tears in my eyes, I went out to that sand and I told those nurses, I said, don't you let anything happen to my sister. And as I left that hospital, I got in my car and I prayed. And he said again, whose report are you going to believe? And I said, I believe your word, Jesus. I trust your word, Jesus. I got home, and before I could lay down, the nurses called me and they said, we just wanted to let you know that we're moving your sister out of ICU. I said, thank you, Jesus. See, before I left the hospital, they told me she was going to have to be in ICU for the next week at least. He turned it around from, my, from that hospital room to the car. They said, we're moving her out of ICU. I said, do it, Jesus. Do it, Jesus. So I was able to lay down in peace. Talk about a mind regulator. A prayer answering God. And so, as I went through that situation, God told me, as this invitation came to speak tonight, he said, I brought you through. I took you through that emotional roller coaster so that you would be able to minister to someone else that is experiencing a 911 emergency situation. Someone that's doubting within your mind and within your heart what God is capable of doing on your behalf. When I say I know the feelings, I know the feelings. Prior to praying on the side of that sister's bed, I prayed on the side of my older sister's bed. And she made a transition. God took her to glory. She's resting now, but God took her through and God did a thing that I didn't know was possible and I didn't know that I could handle and that I could be able to stand here before you today and even share. But even in that, he ministered to my heart and told me, and she told me, that she trusts God. And it was a trust God even if I don't live. Even if he doesn't heal my physical body. As long as my spiritual man is in the right relationship with God. And my peace calling and election is sure. I have no fear. I have no fear. My sister laid in that hospital bed and she said, I'm not worried. If I live another day to God be the glory. But if he decides to take me to God be the glory, hey, yet I will see. She said, I'm going to heaven, I'm not afraid. Hey, and as I sat on the side of her bed, I knew she meant what she said. And I began to, to scream on the inside, God, how is she okay with this? But her heart was fixed. And her mind was made up. For God, I live. And for God, I die. And y'all, if I leave nothing else with you, if we can't make it up in our minds, within our hearts to know that there's nothing in this world that's worth losing our soul. Nothing in this world that's worth giving up our relationship with God. God showed me what it means to be at peace. Yet I will see. She laid on that bed, leaving two children behind and a spouse. And she said, I trust God. I don't know how, but he's going to take care of it. My God, I left the room and I began to scream in the parking lot, God, I knew she was okay with it. She said, whatever God does, whatever he wills, I'm, I'm going to be all right. What does it mean to have a right relationship? What does it mean to have an unclogged heart? What does it mean to be in right relationship with God and comprehend and experience all that he wants for us to? Scripture says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God says that he comes that we might have an abundant life. Come on. Yet I won't see. 
You ask me what's the cure to that clogged heart? How can I get through this pain and this desperation? The fear and the anxiety that I am experiencing is unreal. There's a depression that's so deep it says, I don't even want to live anymore. I don't care if I wake up the next day. I've been there. I know what you're talking about. Oh, but the God of all creation. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to my own understanding. That means we're not going to be able to comprehend it all, ladies. We're not going to be able to figure it out or fathom it out in our minds. But I got to say, I trust you, God. That's the cure right there, to trust Jesus. To let him do the work. Feeling fatigued. There's something that we have to learn to do in the process because we get so overwhelmed. And well, I don't know about you, but as women of God, more frequently than not, instead of sitting there with our legs crossed and our hands tight together, if there's an issue, there's a problem, we're going we gonna to jump to it and find a solution. We're going to do it ourselves. But you know what God is calling for from us? One of the cures, one of the actions that we can follow, one of the steps that we can take in order to receive the deliverance and the healing of our heart that we stand in need of is to be patient. Y'all yeah. know what that means? That means steady your busy hands. Steady your busy mind. Because you're busy trying to figure it out yourself. Be patient. He said, yeah, I know you can do it. I made you a strong woman, invincible woman, a mighty woman. But be patient. Seek me first, the kingdom of God. Seek me for the guidance and direction before you jump to the conclusion of what you can do and how you're going to resolve it. Did you ask him? Did you ask, did you ask God what he thought about the situation? Did you ask him for instruction of what to do next? Seek me first. And let me do the adding. Oh, we can do some quick calculation, ladies, doing bills, whatever it may be. I know how much money is going. I know what I'm going to spend on it. And I know where it's going to go. But he said, be patient. Be patient. You know why? Isaiah 40 and 31, it says, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall do what? Renew your strength. There's, that's why you fatigue, because you can't be patient. We're running around doing it ourselves because we can't be patient and ask God for the help and the strength and the guidance and the direction that we stand in need of. But they that wait upon the Lord, he shall, it's a promise. It's not a maybe, it's not possibly, but it said, he declared in his word, he shall renew your strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Hey, yet I'm gonna see. That means that you're not just gonna make it through but you're going to soar through. You're going to soar through this thing. They shall run and not be weary. What are you worried about? What are you discouraged about? When we wait on the Lord and let him give us the strength that we stand in need of, he's faithful to perfect that thing and do it a, a great way. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's why I know anytime we're feeling, feeling that fatigue and feeling like we can't do it no more, that ain't us. That's not what God designed for us. If it is us, it's operating in our flesh. Because he says if we wait upon him, and he's faithful to fulfill his word, he's going to renew his strength. How many need to be renewed tonight? How many need to be renewed tonight? We need to be patient. We need to seek the face of God. We need to call upon him while he is near. We need to ask God for forgiveness and for guidance for all that we stand in need of and more. I'm going to do a quick wardrobe change as I'm, as I'm getting prepared for our conclusion. Are y'all getting ready? God's good. That's good. And the enemy challenged me tonight. I wasn't out. I was going to do this when I arrived. But I got to do this thing and I got to do it right so that you understand what it means. Because a lot of the insecurities that we're facing, the enemy says, we're not qualified. We can't do it. We can't withstand. We can't make it. We buy ourselves in this thing. That depression, that anxiety, feeling like we're not enough, we're not capable, we're not equipped. 
I put on this sweater just to remind you, for anybody that's questioning if I've called to be here or to speak to you or to share to you tonight, this shirt says RN in training. And this is the same sweatshirt that I wore to my sister's hospital room. This same sweatshirt belongs to my older sister, who was a registered nurse. And she went through the actual, what the, what the world says, the actual um, secular or what, the, 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 the requirements for her to become a nurse. She went through the school work, she, did, she had the discipline and did it with excellence. I don't have that discipline to do medical. I don't have the stomach to take the blood. But what God told me tonight is he said, I sent you there on assignment, I sent you to do one thing as I'm concluding. I sent you to do one thing. There's somebody here in the atmosphere, in this setting, in this room right now, yet I won't see, that's going through and carrying a weight that is so strong that you're questioning whether God is able, whether God is able to heal, whether God is able to lift the weight, whether God is able to carry the burden. I have the registered nurse sweatshirt on because I am acting as a physical representation of an actual device that's used for those that have heart conditions. Those that have heart conditions, if you're familiar with the medical field, there's something called an AED unit. Automatic external defibrillator. What does it do? It shocks the heart. When is it utilized? When the heart is in V-fib. It's going just like this. Yet I'm gonna see. Your heart's going just like this. What does V-fib mean? Let me go to the American Heart Associates de definition because I'm gonna say it wrong if I do it myself. It says ventricular fibrillation, V-fib, is considered the most serious cardiac rhythm disturbance. What does that mean? Electric activity causes the heart's lower chamber to quiver instead of contracting and beating normally. That means the blood is not flowing through our body. The blood is not flowing through someone's spiritual body tonight. You're trying to operate and you're trying to function and you're trying to maintain, but you are desperate. You are weak. You are empty and you are seeking the face of God. And if you trust God, the God in me tonight, I want you to stand with me in agreement that whatever you stand in need of, that your spiritual heart needs just to shock it back into position, shock it back into normal rhythm, that as I touch and agree with you tonight, that God will do that thing that only he can do, that he won't leave you empty, that he won't leave you broken, that he won't leave you feeling inadequate, but that he is faithful to do just what he said he would do. You are not alone. Don't believe the enemy when he says that you're not enough. That's a lie. We serve a more than enough God. Somebody said more than enough. More than enough God. Mighty God. So just as quickly as I put on this registered nurse shirt and walked into that hospital room, you know what it meant to the other hospital workers? Oh, she's got some type of education. Yeah, I got God. He educated me on what he's capable of doing. They didn't ask no questions. They just came to me and just rushed a whole bunch of answers. They started running around. I said, they out there saying that her sister's a nurse. Yeah, I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse of Jesus. That's who called me. That's who qualified me. That's who called you. That's who qualified you. So stop doubting what God is able to do through you. Stop doubting what God is capable of working out on your behalf. Stop doubting what God has set for you. Because if you have goals and ambitions for yourself, you fathom it out, you can write it out, and you can make a plan. God says exceedingly, abundantly above whatever you can ask. Or I think he wants to do that thing for you. Stop selling yourself short. Stop being content with just mediocre when God has called you for greatness. I'm speaking to somebody in VFib right now. I want to touch and agree with you if you believe the word of God, if you believe that his word is true, that he's going to do exceedingly and abundantly above what you can ask or think, that he's able to heal, that he's able to mend, 
that he's able to unclog that heart, whatever symptom you may be experiencing. I said at the beginning that there's stages, there's stages of heart disease. But if we can get to the place that, Lord, no matter what happens to my physical body, in the spirit, Lord, I want to please you. In the spirit, Lord, I want to do your will. In the spirit, Lord, nothing else matters. I put you first before everything I trust. I lean and depend on you, and I lean not on to my own understanding, but in all of my ways acknowledge you. Is this blessed oil over here, Pastor, that I can use? Amen. If you trust and believe the Lord, we're going to conclude in prayer. This is an altar call as well. If you want to trust and believe the Lord with me, I invite the altar workers to join me, but I'm going to touch and agree with somebody that wants to believe God for the impossible. Hey, Believe God for the miracle. Hey, Believe God for the deliverance that you stand in need of, whatever it is. There's nothing too great for our God. Oh, God, somebody get your heart and your mind on Jesus. Hallelujah, we invite your presence in, oh God, and we trust that you're able to do it. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask, I think, oh God. Do the work, do the work, do the work, Jesus. Oh God, mend the hearts, Jesus. Yet I'm also. Mend the hearts, oh God. Mend the hearts, oh God. Yet I'm also. Heal, oh God. In the name of Jesus, deliver, oh God. In the name of Jesus.
Don't give up. 